remember is 12 months ago, the weather in Brisbane. Remember, it was a bit like tonight, except it kept going and going and going. There were some floods. You guys remember that? Anyone, anyone, anyone whose house um, kind of suffered a bit? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to give you a bit of sympathy chocolate. There you go. There you go. I'm so sorry. Oh, oh that's right. My house was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hopefully, you have insurance and you've all sorted that out. But if not, the Fredo Frog, take that as a, as a mild token of commiseration. But 12 months ago, right, the, the, the worst storms, floods we've had in Brisbane in over a decade. Uh, I remember um, there was a house, you know, there was a house that was kind of floating across the Brisbane River. I think there's a photo of it. Maybe, maybe it's on there. Yeah, that's the, that's the, the eye, the, the floods. And there was a house that was kind of floating across. Boom, yeah. There you go. I remember, I remember I saw, um, I remember I saw on, um, on, on Reddit, there was this dude who lives just up the road in Petrie, and he was living at this apartment in Petrie, and, and he took a photo of his balcony, and each day, the water would just get higher and higher and higher. Everyone went, hey, you need to just get out. You need to get out. The water is coming to get you. Imagine that was you for a moment. Imagine, take your mind back to the, the 2022 flood, floods, and uh, your house is being flooded. I've got a question. I want you guys to chat the person next to you. What would you quickly take from your house? What would you take from your house? Have a chat. Might be a good answer. Have a chat. And I want to shout out anything. Your cats. Your two cats. That's a good answer. What up? Tin food. Yeah, that's very practical. Anyone from the back? Your cat, there you go, if you, if you cat lovers, there we go, that's good, that's good, your whole house, that's good. All right, hey, um, hey, the, the, the thing that you answered there, uh, that sort of reveals something about you, about what you value, about what's important to you. Now, I've got, as I said, I've got a baby at home, uh, Harrison, he's a month old yesterday, uh, I've been making sure that I'm taking him, as long as my, with my PlayStation as well, but tonight... We're going to hear some important news. That, that was bad news, right? That was, that was awful news about the floods, right? Like that was a, a thing that devastated our city. Uh, we're going to hear some, some good news. In fact, I'm calling it goat-worthy news. If we understand this, this is really the greatest of all time news. That's what goat stands for. If you, yeah, the greatest, well, this is the best news that you can possibly hear. In fact, if after tonight that you actually don't think that it is the best news, the the goat-worthy news, then perhaps that means you haven't quite understood it. We're looking at something that's far more important than even a flood devastating our city. Far more important than maybe getting your first job. Far more important than getting into uni or, or a sporting team or getting into that relationship that you're after. Because this news, those things are important, right? But this news, if it's true, it changes us forever. It has eternal implications. And so the part of the Bible that is on uh, those little cards, those little cards, they they contain a a few sentences from a book of the Bible. The Bible is not one, but 66 books. And it's actually written by an ex-terrorist. I don't know if you realise that. Written by a dude called Paul, who used to go around killing Christians. Kind of think of like a North Korean kind of secret service kind of agent who's going around killing people that are against them or ISIS. That, that, that's kind of what Paul was like. He was like a religious terrorist. And he's writing to a city, a little bit like Brisbane, this place called Corinth. And there are a bunch of people that were, that were even he was writing to that thought that nothing happens after you die. Now maybe that's you. Uh, maybe you think that this life is all there is. That's a pretty popular uh, kind of viewpoint at the moment. Sort of means that from you know womb to tomb, it, it's game over. That's it. That might be what you believe tonight. But I want to show us tonight uh, that, that this news that's on offer, this go-worthy news, it's life-changing. Uh, and like the house being flooded, this piece of news is something that you want to cling on to. This is of first importance. And there's three words that really sum it up. Uh, that if these three words are true, that changes everything. Ready for these three words? Two people ready. All right. These three words are, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Now, some of you tonight, you see that and immediately you're kind of switched off, right? You're like, 
Jesus, did he, did he even exist? And Jesus is alive? Like, you're talking about a dude who was like maybe a couple of thousand years ago, and you're saying he's alive. Before we kind of look at kind of what he's on about, let's just kind of examine some of the evidence. Is this really legit? There's a historian, a quite famous uh, historian called Tom Holland. He's not a Christian. Not Spider-Man Tom Holland, uh, but a guy Tom Holland. And he says this, and he says, there is no reason to doubt the essentials of this narrative, the story of the Bible. Even the most sceptical historians have tended to accept them. The death of Jesus of Nazareth on the cross is an established fact, he says. Another historian, a guy called Craig Evans, he says that no serious historian of any religious or non-religious stripes, so like no historians, whether they're kind of religious or not, they doubt that Jesus of Nazareth, that's where Jesus is from, where Jesus Christ, whether he really lived in the first century and was executed under the authority of Pontius Pilate. So even the, the atheist, kind of, kind of sceptical uh, historians, people that have kind of devoted their life to understanding the, the world and, and um, history and, and archaeology, and they've looked at the evidence. They're not Christian, but even the most sceptical, that there is a consensus that Jesus was a real dude. In fact, more than that, that he actually died on the, on the cross under this guy called Pontius, who was a Pontius Pilate, who was this, this Roman governor. Now, there's a bunch of people outside the Bible that, that talk about Jesus. I wouldn't have time to kind of talk about all those evidence. But if he never, if he didn't even have the Bible, right? If the Bible was, if all the copies of the Bible were burnt, destroyed, forgotten, there would still be significant evidence to, to paint a bit of a picture of the life of Jesus. Uh, in fact, uh, the Bible itself, though, can actually be seen even by historians as. A, uh, a reliable set of documents. Now, this slide, it's got some small text, but, but you can hopefully you understand circles, right? There's pictures of circles, right? And on the left, there's, uh, on your right, sorry, there's uh, yellow circles. They're kind of ancient documents, ancient documents. Things like, who's heard of Homer, not Homer Simpson, who's a poet? Anyone heard of them? It's Julius Caesar, you've heard of Julius Caesar. Yeah, evidence for, for, for these guys uh, is kind of, the bigger it is, the more evidence there is, right? On the left, you've got the Bible. And you've got thousands and thousands of copies of ancient copies of the Bible. So if you kind of take the fact that Caesar was a real dude, that he was around, and we can trust what's written about him, there's way more evidence for the early copies of the Bible, way more evidence for the life of Jesus that we have out there. Now, I'd love to chat more about that. Chat, chat to the leaders on the question tables afterwards. We'd love to, to chat more. But let's actually look at what they have to say. Now, there's a guy, Paul. Uh, Paul, this ex-terrorist, right? He... He, um, he lists, even in um, what we read tonight, you've got those little cards, um, he writes about some of this evidence. Now, it should pop up on the screen, but sentence number five on your little card, um, he says this. Um, and remember, if this isn't true, it's a waste of time. In fact, Paul even says later that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that Christians are lame. They're pathetic. They're just time wasters. Uh, and if that's true, then, then we're wasting our time, really. But let's see. Is it true? What, what was the evidence that Paul gives? Well, in sentence number five, it says this, that Jesus rose and after that he appeared to Cephas or Peter and then to the twelve. Now, Paul, he's not writing on blind faith, right? Uh, Paul just didn't make this stuff up. The whole bunch of other people back then... Uh, that, that saw Jesus, the resurrected Jesus who appeared to Peter. Peter's still alive this time when Paul's writing in about 53 AD, 20 years or so after Jesus. In fact, um, Peter and Paul hung out. They had disagreements over things. They, Peter even wrote books of the Bible, one and two Peter. He wrote. And Peter was actually so convinced that Jesus was a real not just a real guy, but he actually really did rise from the dead. Peter, uh, history tells us that Peter actually died for his faith, and that he was killed, crucified, died on the cross, and he didn't want to go the same way that Jesus did. He went upside down. Uh, Paul keeps on going. Then to the 12, he says, there's more evidence. The 12, that's the 12 apostles, 12 disciples, the guys that saw him alive, and you can read about some of their lives in the book of Acts. But even more evidence. After that, he appeared for, to more than 500 men and women, brothers and sisters, at the same time, most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep. That doesn't mean literally asleep, but some have died. Uh, for the Christian, if you believe in this, in that Jesus really did rise from the dead, and dying is just like falling asleep. But more than 500 people, Paul says, actually saw 
Jesus after he died. That's one thing for one or two to kind of have, you know, some crazies. Uh, if you hang around Eaton's Hill Hotel in a few hours, you might get some interesting interpretations about what's happened after a few cans of courage. But, um, you know, but, but 500 people saw Jesus. And Paul says, hey, a bunch of them are still alive. You can ask them. You can see if what they're saying stacks up, if it's true. 500 wasn't enough. Paul goes one step further. Then he appeared to James. Now, why is that something about James? Who's this dude? Well, James was actually Jesus' brother. Hands up, who's got a brother? A whole bunch of you, right? Now, I've got a brother. He's a lawyer. He's a little bit taller than me. He's better at sport. You know, there's a lot of comparison kind of going on there. Makes a lot more money. Lives in a more expensive house. All those things. But hey, imagine, imagine if your brother claimed to be the son of God, right? Wow, maybe he already has. I mean, that's not an imagination. That's a reality. And then, and then he rose from the dead. And people are talking about that. Like that's, imagine, like that's like such a, that sort of claim takes a ridiculous amount of evidence, right? If it's your own brother. Like, I know, I know what he's like. I grew up with him. If you're anything like me, you'd be a bit skeptical. And James, he was skeptical. He was skeptical of Jesus. He needed a lot of evidence. And yet, he was so convinced by the evidence that he actually gave up his job as a tradie. He ended up kind of being a pastor, a church leader in Jerusalem. And he wrote the book of James. Paul keeps going with more evidence. Then last of all, he appeared to me as the one abnormally born. He says, for I'm the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because, here's his terrorism, I persecuted the church of God. See, Paul, he includes his own experience there. Uh, remember, he was, he, was, yeah, he was a terrorist and yet he met Jesus. One day he was, he was on the road to this city called Damascus and he met the resurrected Jesus. He was blind. He couldn't see for a while. He had this profound experience. He was so convinced by who Jesus was. Uh, he stopped chucking Christians in jail and having them killed. Uh, he moved from being a persecutor to a preacher and even a prisoner. Uh, he got beat up for his faith because he was so convinced it was legit. Friends, tonight, Jesus, he, he was a real dude. History is undeniable. And he really did die on the cross. 500 people saw him after he rose to the dead, including his skeptical brother, including his ex-terrorist, Paul. There was, and 11 of the disciples were so convinced of this, they, they even died as well. They were so convinced they became martyrs that they, they sacrificed their life to tell more people about Jesus. You know, I became a Christian uh, when I was older than a lot of you guys, when I was about 18, 19, uh, because I, I was skeptical. But yet I became convinced that Jesus really did rise from the dead. That this was true, that the history stacked up. Before uh, being a Christian, I was trying to live a life for myself. Uh, I was trying to impress others. I was trying to go, you know, chase after the world. I'd get drunk. I'd chase after girls, that sort of thing. I was trying to be cool. But when I became convinced of this stuff, it, it changed everything. It changed my life. The God of the universe loved me. Cared about me. Wow. In fact, he loved me so much he'd rather die for me than live without me. He wanted to have a relationship with me. And he wants that with you. Now, some of you might have questions. I covered evidence stuff pretty quickly. I, 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 I'd love to chat with you more afterwards, as would the leaders. But I'm convinced. And all the people in the leader's shirts are as well, and perhaps your, your friend who invited you tonight, they're convinced, and a lot of you, most of you guys are smarter than me, um, that Jesus, he really is alive. Jesus is alive. All right, you might be thinking, okay, well, maybe he is, right? Maybe there was a Jesus, maybe he was alive. Or maybe actually tonight you actually are convinced, uh, and you do think that's true. But you're thinking, okay, so what, like, this thing happened a couple of thousand years ago. Like, maybe it did happen. Maybe, like, yeah, miracles could happen. But so what? Well, why is this goat-worthy news? What's Christianity all about? Uh, we'll, we'll keep those little cards open. The verses will pop up on the screen. Let me just read a few sentences to you. Uh, Paul says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. That means good news. I preach to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, 
by this pronouncement of good news, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the, the word I preach to you, otherwise you believe in vain. Paul, he wants to remind people that this is good news. This is goat-worthy news. This is changing news. You guys need to remember this. So life is not a waste of time in vain. And he says this in verse 3, For what I received, Jesus, he taught me, I passed on to you as of first importance. Remember the floods. This is the first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, if you want a summary of what Christianity is all about, if you want kind of a, you know, a chat GBT, what's the Bible all about? This verse, it, it really hits it. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. I'm going to just walk us through that a little bit. Firstly, Christ died for our sins. Christ, that's a, a title, it's not Jesus' last name. It literally just means king. Jesus, the king, he died in a real place, Jerusalem. Um, I've got um, some friends that I went to Bible college with. They, they, they've been to a place where possibly some historians think is the actual tomb of Jesus. Um, but Jesus, he had to die a physical death so that he could pay for our sins. Now let's look at that. For our sins. Now sin is kind of a, it's this weird religious word that's sort of used by our culture in, in kind of funny ways. Like it's you know, a bit sinful for me to kind of eat ice cream at midnight. That's not what it's talking about. No. Now Jesus didn't just die to kind of give us some good philosophy, to preach just this vague message of love or, or to kind of be a, a martyr standing up for injustice. I know those things are important. Um, there's some truth in that, but they, they missed the point. Here's why Jesus came. To die for our sins. Now what's that? What's sin? Sin isn't, you know, doing kind of a bit of naughty things. Sin is like, you know, flipping the bird to God. Sin is ignoring our creator. See, God, he's perfect. He's pure. He's holy. Uh, he's not like you or I. God has perfect standards. He's not just going to let like a little bit of my selfishness or laziness or lust or anger or pride into his presence. Like that's not how it works. I can't have a relationship with God with my, my sin. And if we're honest with ourselves, uh, we're, we're far more selfish, sinful than we can imagine. Now, imagine for a sec that um, everything you ever did, you ever thought, every website that you ever went to, if, if the things that you thought about yourself when you looked in the mirror or looked at others uh, in real life social media, if all that, that kind of story was, was, was uploaded onto a private, unlisted YouTube link, and someone said, hey, we're going to play that movie tonight. Here we go. Hands up who would want to see that. A few of you. There you go. Hands up who would be proud and would want, hey, we would want to see, let others see that. Uh, okay, a okay, couple. There you go. Um, I think we're honest with ourselves. Uh, if we're honest with just how we even fall short of our own standards, we let ourselves down, let alone our parents, teachers, but let alone God, God who has perfect standards. That's our sin. Jesus, God looks at us and actually he knows what we've done and actually it, it, it hurts him. He says, what you've done, what I've done, Mike, what you have done, it's disgusting. You've flipped the bird to me. You've ignored me. And yet, I love you. God knows the movie of our lives far better than we do. And yet, he loves us. And he says, you know what? What you, do, what you did, I care about right and wrong. I'm going to punish it. But instead of you going through that punishment, I'm going to throw my punishment on my son, Jesus. So on the cross, Jesus, he died to cop that beating that you and I deserve. That's what it means when it says Christ died for our sins. But the story doesn't end there. Keep reading in, in sentence four. He was buried and he raised the dead according to the scriptures. This part is crucial. If Jesus had stayed in the ground, it would not be quite worthy news. We would not have any hope. All that would have happened is Jesus came to give us a good example, which is nice and, and maybe helpful, but it's not game-changing news. Jesus didn't stay dead in the tomb, but he overcame death so that we too 
can overcome death. It means that death, it's not the end of us. You know, it's kind of a you know, an old-timey saying, maybe like your teachers or your parents have said this, but you know, there's two certainties in life, they are. Death and taxes. Death and taxes. Well done. There you go. I didn't throw that far enough. So if you trust in Jesus, you won't have to pay tax. No, that's not what we're talking. No, no. If you trust in Jesus, it means that death is no longer a thing we have to fear. Death, a certainty. No, no. If you trust in Jesus, there's a greater certainty that there's life after death. You know, last, uh, last Sunday, um, my family got together and we, we scattered the ashes of my grandpa. Now, my grandpa, he, he lived a, a pretty good life. Uh, he was 93. Uh, he was a doctor for more than 50 years. Uh, he could speak multiple languages. I think he probably read about a thousand books in his life. Um, and he had six kids, I think 16, no, 12 grandchildren, and I can't remember how many great grandchildren. But uh, he, he lived a pretty good life. He was a pretty impressive guy in, in lots of, of accounts. But for him, and for anyone who dies, without Jesus, there's no hope. Now, the best we can really hope for is to live a long life of 93 years and then be ashes, buried in a nice suit, a nice dress in the ground. But no friends. There is way more hope than that. The Bible says that through the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available for you and I. God raised Jesus from the dead and God will raise you from the dead if you trust in him. And the, the hope that we have, it's not just kind of, you know, you get respawned and kind of, all right, back to this kind of cruddy life again. No, it's, the hope of heaven is way better. It's a life of no more depression, no more divorce, no more destruction. No more doubt, no more despair, no more devastation, no more poverty, injustice, bullying. The the junk that we all have to face in this life gone. That's what the hope is on offer through Jesus. Heaven's a place of partying, of of feasting, of laughter, of dancing, of rejoicing, of living forever. That's what's on offer for you. Come back with me um, to sentence number one. Copy your cards. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you believed in me. You now, Christianity, it's not, it's not just pie in the sky when you die. It's not just this future hope, as good as that is. The good news of Christianity, it's, um, it, it, it's steak on your plate while you wait. It's not just pie in the sky when you die. It's steak on your plate while you wait. Sorry if you're a vegan. That analogy just totally missed the mark. But Christianity means that God is with us now. We can have a real relationship with him today. How do we do it? What's the kind of transaction mechanism? How do we become a Christian? Paul says this, verse 10, By the grace of God, I am what I am. Grace. What does that mean? It's not like an elegance, it's not like a, a dancer. Grace means an undeserved gift. Hands up who's had a birthday recently. A few people have. Here you go, got a birthday present for you guys. You're like, yeah, like March. Like April, that's recent, right? There you go. Um, now imagine, right? Imagine if I gave you something better than a Milky Top Freddo, right? Imagine uh, if I had a better present, right? If an iPhone, that's the iPhone 15, right? Pre-release model. Imagine if I had an iPhone 15 for you, yeah? And I gave that to you. Happy birthday. Um, It's not good enough just to kind of go, all right, yep, I believe that I've got that. You you can't just look at the picture of that and say, yeah, I believe that. Uh, You might even kind of see an iPhone case and go, yeah, yeah. It's there. It's an iPhone. You might even get an iPhone T-shirt, get like an Apple tattoo on your bicep. You might even read the instruction manual, you know, the 176 pages of terms and conditions that no one bothers to read. You might memorize them and go, yeah, like, I've got an iPhone. Like, you might even just kind of hang out in an Apple store each week, be part of the Apple club. You might do all those things, right? But until you actually grab hold of this, 
You know, you're not an iPhone user, right? You're just a pretender. Some of us tonight, we, we're pretenders. We're not actually Christians. See, it doesn't matter. It's not about kind of grabbing onto it really tightly, right? It's not about having spiritual muscles that, that, that hold on to this thing. No, no, it's actually about believing and receiving, right? Believing that Jesus really did rise from the dead and receiving that good news for yourself. I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to do that right now. Um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe it's your first time tonight and this has just clicked for you. Uh, you've actually understood the message of Christianity for the first time. Maybe you go to a Christian school or you've, you've had some kind of Christian back, you know, upbringing or you've watched some stuff on YouTube, but now it makes sense. Or maybe uh, you have been coming for a while Maybe you're here regularly. Maybe you're in a Christian family. Uh, and yet you realize that actually, no, you haven't believed. You haven't received. You've just been going through the motions. Uh, well, it's an opportunity now. Jesus loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He died for you. And there's life for you. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. I'm going to give you an opportunity to become a Christian. Now, for others, though, that, like maybe, this, hey, you're not ready for this, right? You've got more questions. That's so good. Again, would love to chat with you. Come to the tables afterwards. I'll be floating around as well. Keep coming. Keep coming back. Come to Yak if you can. That's going to be a sick time just to, to have fun uh, and just to have heaps of space um, kind of away from the busyness of life just to kind of really figure this stuff out. Like, if, if this stuff's true, right? If Jesus really did rise from the dead, that, that changes your eternity. It's worth kind of investing a few days of your holidays for it. I'm going to pray a prayer now. Now, this is not some kind of fancy hocus-pocus prayer. This isn't like some crazy kind of religious, super spiritual prayer. I'm calling it the teaspoon prayer, right? If you, if you have a cook, shorthand teaspoon, TSP, right? Thank you, sorry, please. That's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to, I'm going to thank God for what he's done. I'm going to say sorry for what we've done. I'm going to say please. Please forgive us. And please, may we be in a relationship with you tonight. So I'm going to pray that prayer. Uh, I'm going to pray it slowly. If you agree with the prayer, just echo the words in your heart. You don't have to say it out loud. Um, but can I just ask that everyone close their eyes? Um, and just put your head down. Like, I know praying might not be your jam, but can, just for the sake of others, uh, can everyone just close their eyes and put their heads down? That'd be, that'd be really helpful. Great. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing us here tonight. Thank you for sending Jesus to die in our place. Thank you for offering us this free gift before us. We are sorry that we sin against you in ways we see and ways we don't even see. We don't even realize how bad and gross this is to you, but we are sorry. Please forgive us our sin. And may we be able to be friends with you. We trust in you, Jesus, who rose again so that we too can rise. And Lord, for those of us who have doubts and questions, would you speak to us and give us answers and show us that we need you and may this good news be real to us. In Jesus' name, amen. How good is Jesus? We'd love you to come down here to youth to hear about him every Friday night from 7 till 9.30 p.m.